<laughs> Hello everyone, we're going to get started. Ooh, that's nice and loud. <laughs> For a change. Um, so hello and welcome to the Ken French May 2023 educational presentation. Uh, my name is Cindy Robichaux. I think everybody here knows me. <laughs> um, I'm part of the Kent Branch operating team and your host for tonight. So thank you all for coming. This presentation will be recorded. Thanks to Colleen. And we would like to thank the McKinley family and staff for always allowing us to use this beautiful space and all their facilities. We really appreciate their ongoing support. And personally, I would like to thank my team um, for assisting to pulling this together. They're always there when we need um, things done, and I truly appreciate each and every one of you. <laughs> so let's get started. So I'm going to do this, and I think everybody already knows there's no new people here, but we all know we're the Kent Branch. We're part of the Ontario Genealogical Society, also known as Ontario Ancestors. Founded in 1961, it's the largest genealogical society in Canada with more than 30 branches and special interest groups all across Ontario. And we are the local branch in Chatham-Kent with a mission to promote and preserve local history and genealogy. Our Family History Library is located on the second floor of the Chatham-Kent Public Library in Chatham. It holds 45 years worth of historical and genealogical resources. We are open to the public on Fridays and Saturdays from 1 to 5 p.m. and we try to accommodate other times by appointment. And we really wish you would come and visit us. Uh, we've been very busy the last uh, few months. I think COVID has list lifted now and everybody's wanting to get back and see people in person. So we've had a very busy couple months. We always like to connect with people interested in genealogy and local history. You can contact us at our email on the screen. You can also join our Kent Branch Facebook group, which has over 700 people that are interested in genealogy and local history. And we also have a very comprehensive website that has a lot of great resources for our branch members, but also for the public. We host monthly presentations such as this one, but we do take a break in June, July, and August. Mark your calendar because September the 8th will be our first meeting back for the fall and it is an online presentation. We actually are going to have a representative from FamilySearch. Um, she's going to join us to talk about how to find Ontario land records on the FamilySearch website. So I struggle with this. I find things on the on land website and then to try to get all the material and all the wheels and all the extra stuff which is on Family Search. I struggle with that. So she said that she's going to walk us through how to manage that. And then October 13th at seven o'clock, um, we are going to have Eric Skillings join us and he's going to be, this is going to be online as well. Um, he's going to talk about the histories and the amalgamations of the churches for the South Buxton Pastoral Charge and the Romney Pastoral Charge. And then to wrap up the year, don't know if you remember, but we used to go on field trips every once in a while, once a year, and that was always a lot of fun. So we are going to do that again on November the 4th. We're going to head out to Breath, uh, Blenheim, and we're going to go to the Blenheim Freedom Library and Military Museum. And it's going to be on a Saturday. We don't have all the details yet, but we will put it on our Facebook and send it in our monthly update and on the website. Um, they're very excited to have us. Uh, Colleen and I actually had a chance to visit them. They have so much stuff there, so much genealogical for that area. It's amazing. So it's going to be a really good um, field trip. So this year, Kent Branch turned 45. And thanks to Frank Vink for reminding us about this. <laughs> because with COVID, everything just kind of blurred together. So uh, we are very proud of the Kent Branch um, who has you know, supported and promoted family history and assisted researchers and provided many services to the community for four, over 45 years. The work and the dedication of the previous and the current members and volunteers has built this strong organization um, with every, when we're passionate about everything to do with family history. So a lot has happened over the last 45 years and times have really, really changed. Um, but we're looking forward to a lot more years. So 
after the presentation, please stay. We have cake and crackers and cheese, and we want to chat with you and have some social time and a little bit of celebrating. Because 45 years is a long time for an organization to be uh, still going strong. Okay, so let's get to tonight's presentation. We are very pleased to have well-known local historian, author, and friend of Kent Branch, Lisa Gilbert, joining us. Lisa wears many hats, <laughs> and one of them is a costume historian. It is with this hat on that she will speak about how to identify the age of a photograph by looking at the clothes in the picture. She will give us a thumbnail sketch of the 19th and early 20th century clothing and provide some resources to sleuth out the approximate date of the photograph and the people that are in it. So let's welcome Lisa. We'll turn it over to you. I'll switch out the PowerPoint. Thank you. Just give me a second. I know my face now, is You know, I, I, I'm a long time member of the Kent Historical Society. I used to say when I first jo joined the Kent Historical Society, which was like in 1979 or something like that, I said, I bring down the median age of that group by half. I don't anymore. <laughs> but I remember, you know, even in the early 80s, the, um, we always said the Genealogical Society in Chatham Kent is an amazing group. Uh, for all those years, for, for, for 45 years, you've been doing really good work, really good work. And I was just telling my brother today that you are an exceptional branch. So uh, kudos to you for reaching 45 years. The Kent Historical Society actually celebrated its 100th anniversary back in 2012. So we're very old, but I can't say that we've been as active as you guys have been for the last 100 and some years. We had some years where, well, in fact, actually, I'd like somebody to do a history of the Kent Historical Society, and of course, nobody's going to do it. So someday I might get around to it, maybe. Um, but but I know there were years when we weren't active at all. Um, there were other years when we were very active. But uh, yeah, we're one of the oldest historical societies in the province. In fact, my understanding is that we're the second oldest. So we formed in 1912 because if you know your child history, which I think you probably do, um, there was a gunboat that was found um, in the Thames and they brought it up and it was, in, it was uh, laid out in Tecumseh Park. And at the time, they hoped to get a museum to house it and that's how the Kent Historical Society was formed for that. Well, you know, the Chatham Kent story. Uh, it was there for uh, until the 30s, sometime in the 30s, and, and it was still sitting out there and it was rotting and people were, you know, I can't, I can't believe it, but my understanding is all, some of the cannonballs and the things that were in the boat were still, like they left them there. So I imagine some of them went missing, a lot of them probably went missing, but anyway, um, that's, that's the Kent Historical Society. And just a little bit about me, I'd like you to know that um, I am, Yes, a local historian, have been a local historian since I was a teenager. Um, I credit my grade eight uh, history teacher for getting me interested in local history because she asked us in grade eight to go take a picture of three different buildings and try to find a story to go along with the history of, the, of those buildings. And yeah, and so then throughout high school, et cetera, et cetera, I've always been local history, but I also was a sewer. I've been a sewer since I was a teenager too. And so then, when, of course, when we had um, heritage days, we wanted all our volunteers to be dressed properly. And of course, many of our volunteers were students. So I started, and you know, you, it's not the kind of thing you can go down to Walmart and buy. <laughs> so I started sewing again because I had stopped. I was, you know, too busy, too busy. And I started sewing again, and then I really got into it. And I love it. To me, it's my favorite part of my life, really, because it allows me to use the creativity that I love to, to use through sewing, but also my history, because I've been researching the history of, of costumes then for about 30 years now. And actually, someday, maybe, if I can find the time, I got too many hats, but someday I want to publish a book on his, the clothing practices in early Upper Canada 
because despite all the years that I've been doing this, and I know you know many, many other people who are in the same field in, in Ontario, um, nobody really knows what people wore and how they got their clothing. But I can tell you, it wasn't that story of the pioneers, you know, how they went out and they grew their own. Oh, no, no, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. But, you know, maybe someday. Someday, maybe. But in the meantime, um, I'm, I'm here tonight to give you just a very, very, very brief introduction to this. Because it is, I mean, I, I have just a selection of my books. Um, I have probably 50 or more books on costume history. And you can just drill down. I just finished reading a book about pockets. <laughs> a whole book about pockets. I know, it sounds pretty dry, doesn't it? But actually, it was fascinating. Because you can read about women's history through pockets. Yeah, anyway, but so, so I, won't, I won't give you that, those details tonight, okay? I'll just uh, be very brief. And uh, so I'm assuming that, you know, most of you have come across pictures of your ancestors at one time or another and you wondered you know what date is that is that date right anyway so this i i put the put these booklets together for you to keep again it's just a very very brief kind of um visual representation but um, um I'm, I'm hoping that you you know you might find them somewhat useful so um yeah And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wait a minute. I should have probably had those passed out to, while I was talking. <laughs> um, because it, if you look at the first page, it is um, this, this uh, stuff too, so. Whatever, you're wearing whatever it is that you had on. So those, oftentimes you see people wearing clothes that are many years out of date. And that's, you know, that's not any different today. So today, I wore this, what I'm wearing on purpose. Because this outfit that I'm wearing, not the shirt, but my pantsuit is at least 30 years old. Right? And I bet you all of you do that too. Yeah. Right? Of course, especially once you get older, you know, when you're younger, you want to be in stuff. Well, that wasn't any different in those days. So young people, so and keep that in mind when you're looking at pictures. If it's somebody young, then there's a better chance that they're going to be up to date. If it's older, they're, you know what, they can't be bothered buying new clothes necessarily, right? And that's not true across the board. But, but yeah, so you're going to often see people wearing clothes out of date. So if, if you're looking at the clothes and going, well, those, those clothes look like they're 1870s, but this should be 1880s, it could very well be, right? So keep that in mind. Um, but the general, so the general rule is that clothes can come forward, right? People, especially working class folks, could and did wear clothes that were many years out of date. And as well, the clothes that they made or bought because again, I'm saying this idea, this myth that we have that the pioneers made all their own clothes is just that. It's a myth. All right? But so they bought, they bought, and they bought a lot of used clothing too. Second hand, the secondhand market was very popular. I mean, it's still today, right? People go thrifting, right? Yeah. Well, it wasn't any different in those days, right? But they, they were more classic. They were... They didn't have a lot of frou-frou. They were basic, right? So you, your basic woman's outfit was pretty much the same throughout most of the 19th century. If you're poor, the poorer sort. So that makes it a lot harder to date. And so then, what do you have to do? Well, if you can't date it with clothes, then maybe you need to look at hairstyles. Maybe you need to look at any kind of accessories. Hairstyles is a good one, but then you got then that's a whole other story. Like dating <laughs> photographs by hairstyles. But you know, you there are books out there. I was I was suggesting to Cindy that this would be a book if, if anyone is interested. 
Um, it's again, it's just women. Um, but this one, this book actually goes through and has um, for each each section. I just passed it. Where did it go? Yeah. See, every year, hats and hairstyles change to what they changed. Again, it's this is not necessarily what the real people wore, but but you know, it gives you an idea. Uh, and shoes, it talks about shoes, different shoes, things like that. So that's what you have to do um, is to look at that kind of thing as well if you're trying to date, right? Um, but the general rule is that they can come forward, but they can't go backwards. So if you see a woman dressed in clothing, and actually I think I need to go to the next thing, don't I? Sorry. Yeah. So if you see a woman dressed in clothing, that appears to be from the 1890s. It can't be a picture from the 1870s. Now, I picked this picture on purpose because, I don't know, do you see the family resemblance? <laughs> <laughs> my, my brother, my oldest brother, I have four brothers. My oldest brother is the genealogist in the family. And we have a WhatsApp, our family WhatsApp. And he posted it on the family WhatsApp a couple weeks ago. And so he had found it on Ancestry dot com or dot ca or whatever um and he said so his his question was to, to the rest of the family so who do you think this is and who does she look like well of course everybody's because she does she looks a lot like members of my family so we all said well she's got to be related somehow and then of course the tribe people are saying well what date is it and all that and so of course i chimed in and i said well because because some people were saying 1860s and you know I says well no clothes her clothes say 1890s and I said really her hairstyle says 1890s as well she's a classic 1890s so that's why I actually put that there because of course my brother says no 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 she can't be uh, from the candy from the 1890s because in the 1890s she'd be in her 50s and she doesn't look and she had she had 11 kids <laughs> she doesn't look like somebody who's 50. In <laughs> i know i and i said well i said i don't know but this is definitely from the 1890s Are you sure it's not from the 1860s or 70s no no and we'll you'll see we'll come back to her all right so let's start looking I started with the 1830s, sorry, because I like the 1830s and a lot of work photographed in the 1830s. But so we won't spend a lot of time. But I, I just love that look. I mean, it's not very practical to wear. I have tried to wear it, and it's not. Like, look at those sleeves. Look how wide they are, right? And look at the hats, right? Look at how big those hats. I actually have a hat that is that big. And well, every hat I wear, actually every hat. <laughs> they took a picture there was a reenactment last weekend and somebody took a picture of me and put it on Facebook and there's my hat like, I, I don't know I got a crooked head I guess I don't know but anyway no uh, um, so that 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 look of the 1830s you'll see it come back and it's very interesting actually to see fashion trends you know we think of uh, retro fashion as being something that's modern but no -uh, definitely not this is actually a throwback to the 1670s and 80s. Um, and, you know, they didn't call it that, but that's what it is. If you look at the fashions from the 1670s and 80s, you're going to see that same look, right? Um, now, men. Okay. Men. Take a good look. Okay, so that is what we call a frock coat, basically. Um, You've heard it called, it, it, it has different names. I think of it as a frock coat. And that style of coat, um, actually, like that basic style, actually, the basic style, when I talked about Charles II, that was a basic style, except his sleeves were, you know, they had these tremendously huge cuffs, and, um, you know, they had the long curly wigs, and the the, um, the, the, the shoes with the big bows, none of that. But the, but the actual coat that he wore was very similar to that. But the sort of modern, what we call a modern iteration of this, it actually started in the 1810s. 
certainly in the 1820s. But so that's that style coat that has a waist and then a, then a, a skirt of some sort, right? That style, well, you'll see. <laughs> it's a, it was a very popular stuff. Top hats. Yeah, so if you look carefully at men's top hats, you will see that they change in their shape and their size. But you got to look real hard because the top hat was popular throughout the 19th century. The top hat became popular in the 1780s, and it really, in some ways, it still hasn't gone up, right? you still see people who are dressed for a formal occasion wearing a top hat. But so, yeah, and I, and I do apologize for the quality of this. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, this, this whole presentation, quality-wise, isn't the greatest. Um, but uh, I, I did the best I could with the time I had. But so, and this is, a, a, you're also going to find here, too, that there aren't that many books about men's fashion. You know, there are, it's very hard to find books of men's fashions. So this is one of them that I took. Um, I took the pictures from. Uh, so actually, it was in the 1830s. I don't know. No, it was earlier than that, but it's especially in the 1830s. You know, they they say that the corset. You know, the court the court is the forerunner. Uh, it, it, it's a forerunner of the bra, really. It's, a, it's very interesting to see. That's another whole story, right? Uh, how, how we think of a corset as being a girdle, but it, it, it wasn't until the 1910s, when the corset was almost done, that it sort of became generated so that it held this part in. It's supposed to hold these babies in, right? Um, and, but so the corset was invented by a man whose last name was Corset, in the early 19th century for men because men wore skin tight clothing and they needed the figures even more than women but women of course got them too because they needed to, to keep the ladies up so anyway that's the 1830s 30s so yeah you can see that the that in this this picture is not as um, obvious, but in the 1830s, men definitely wanted to have a nice, slim waist. So, moving to the 1840s, okay, so, okay, the sleeves are obviously uh, an obvious difference. The skirts, skirts are getting bigger, right? Sh the hats, they're starting to look more like what you think of as Civil War, American Civil War hats, right? The style was changing. This was the time, again, I, I apologize for the quality, but this was the time period uh, where you have these elaborate hairstyles that would have, they'd have buns that kind of went straight up. You can't see it here because they all have hats on, but um, that was the style. Um, but yeah the skirts are getting bigger and you're starting to see you'll see that two of them have flounces those skirts have flounces you know what i mean by flounce is there anybody who doesn't know because speak now yeah it's when you have late like different layers right like almost like lace right so so you'll see that the the dress on the far left it actually has uh, flounces that come up in the middle and then um, actually the, the second and the third both have uh, layers of flounces too. It becomes more pronounced in the 1850s. Another giveaway from the 1840s, I couldn't find any pictures. Um, this one shows, shows uh, to a certain extent. Oh yeah, I got a pointer, don't I? Uh, okay, where's my pointer? Yeah, see the V? See the way the, the especially this one, these two? Um, in the 1840s, the bodice came down very low in some cases. And that's usually when you see a dress like that, you can sort of think 1840s. But again, you know, these generalities always have exceptions. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, that generally means 1840s. Another uh, very popular style in the 1840s was this kind of thing. That's a shirred bodice, shirred. It means it's gathered, 
right? And just for your information, these look like dresses. They look like one piece outfits, but they weren't. They were two. They were always two, two. It's only really in the 20th century that you start getting dresses that are one piece. Usually the bodice is separate. And sometimes the bodice is boned. And sometimes it's, it's sometimes the, they got a corset on and plus they've got a boned bodice too. Um, but so when you wear these clothes, it's actually, if, they're, if you're wearing a, a good fitting corset and a good fitting dress, that, those bones don't bother you at all. In fact, they support you. I like wearing my corset because it gives my back support. Um, so yeah, this idea that, oh no, I could never wear a corset. Yes, you could, if it's made properly. And you know what? The, the, the um, corset makers were mostly men. And I know why, because I've made corsets. Very hard on the hands. So 1840s, there's the men. See, there's that same style. It's so, yeah, like, can you tell the difference? Very hard, especially the guy on the left. He's got sideburns, okay? Not to say that they didn't have, but I think um, it was more a thing. Uh, see, those sideburns aren't as long. Very hard to tell the difference though. The back is shorter. That the one on the on the right hand side is shorter, um, and it's and th that back those pleats they change from year to year, or not year from year to year, but from from uh, you know well, I'd say every three or four years you're going to see differences. But most people don't have their back facing the camera, so you're not going to be able to see it, and it's really really technical stuff that only tailors really look at anyway. The top hats, mm, they look a lot like the ones from the 1830s, don't they? Yeah. So it's really hard. When you're looking at men, if you've only got men to identify, it's tough. It's really tough. So, Actually, a yep. lot of the, the men's stuff Oops. we saw during the coronation. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure I didn't see the coronation because I was busy working, but um, I bet you there were people that were dressed not that far different from that, right? Yeah. Okay, by the 1850s, look at those skirts. And you know, until I, I, I meant to actually check the year and I, I didn't, I think it was something like 1855, these women the only way that they could keep those skirts out was by wearing petticoats. Mm -hmm. And some of them wore as many as 11 or 12 petticoats. Can you imagine trying to walk around with 11 or 12 petticoats underneath your skirt? Finally, the technology developed so that they had crinoline. See, crinoline was a, was a, was a, a, a major development in the 1850s. And then of course, eventually they had these cages, these sprung steel cages that, you know, hoops, right? Yeah, I know, I know, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I can't imagine. But um, so again, the flounces, the very, very wide skirts in the 1850s, especially later in the 1850s. Um, the, so uh, you notice the, uh, where are we again? Where's my, where's my black, where's my, there it is. See this little, um, I don't know what you call it. Um, there's a name for it, I'm sure, but I can't think of it. Um, at the bottom of the, of the bonnet, that's an 1850s thing. Usually when you see that, you see that with, you know, a little house on the prairie? Yeah, it was to, hold, to keep the sun off of their, their neck, but it wasn't a thing earlier. So, you know, if you see that, it wasn't, I would say probably it, would, it, it wouldn't be before the 1840s that you would see that. There's the man again. <laughs> again, it's this drawing, it's this guy, this John Peacock, he draws all his men, they look alike. But, okay, so the top hats are a little bigger, but you still got that frock coat. Now you got a guy wearing white pants or lighter pants. Um, the cravats, okay, they're cravats. That's another thing, I forgot to say that, really. That's a good way, where's my, there, you know, the, these, these things. 
That will help date the photograph too. The cravats changed from, from one period to the next. And in the 1830s, I should have, you, you can't see it in a, red, in a black and white um, drawing, but in the 1830s, they had beautiful silk cravats, um, very colorful. Their cravats um, and their waistcoats were what provided the color, and they weren't afraid of color. Um, but as we move further into the Victorian period, they, they tended to, their cravats tended to be black or dark colored. But they're still kind of more like, like bows. They're not too structured. Okay, 1860s. Now I deliberately picked 1866 because about midway through they started, the skirts started to change. Can you see the difference? They're still big. They're wearing hoops under those, those skirts. But, um, and, and these ladies are, these are ball gowns. So, you know, as opposed to these people, look, they're all covered up, right? But, I mean, the idea that you weren't allowed to show skin, not true at all, definitely not. Not for evening wear. Um, sometimes those, those, you can almost see your nipples. Really, they weren't afraid of that. It was like, you know, it was like they were on display, really. And remember, who made these clothes? These clothes? Men did. Yeah. I mean, women made a lot of the everyday things, but men were the ones who made these things. And they're the ones, especially by the 1860s, we're starting to see these houses of design. Worth is a little bit later, but it's, so, it's just starting that whole system where, yeah, you got houses of design that are telling you what you should be wearing instead of, you know, your mother or something like that. But um, no, the other thing about these dresses is that you're starting to see a change in the line of the back of the dress. So instead of going straight out, and honestly, like 12, 15 yards of fabric they're wearing. So you had to have a lot of money actually to get, you know, to have a, a, a skirt, an outfit made like that. Um, but by the 18, uh, mid 1860s, we're starting to see the beginnings. Well, I'll talk about it in, when we get to the 1870s. Here's the man. I don't know. Okay, you can tell that the waist of those frock coats is a little bit lower. So the waist was higher than the natural waist before. Now it's starting to get a little bit lower. And the cravats, again, it's hard for you to see. Actually, in the 1860s, 50s and 60s, the shirt, which you, it, the, that shirt almost looks like those starched um, collars from the early 20th century. It's not, but the shirt actually changed. The shirt, a man's shirt, was almost exactly the same from about the 16th century to the mid 19th century. And in the, in the mid 19th century, it changed. And so it started to get, instead of just, um, like I, when I make a man's shirt, I take a length of fabric, I fold it in half, and I fold it in half, this is the first thing you do, fold it in half again and cut out a piece for the neck. That's it. Like there's no um, shaping to that shirt at all. Beginning in the 1850s, they start to shape. They start to make the clothes, the, the, like, and the, the shirts that I make, they're a straight piece of a rectangle of fabric. And then another square one that you put in here that was called the gusset, right? That's where you get your shaping. Now they're starting to shape. And they're starting to button all the way down. Whereas before, they just had a button here. And then eventually a little bit of a placket. But now they're starting to button all the way down. But you can't see that, and you don't necessarily see it in a photograph either, unfortunately. All right, so 1870s. See the skirts? That's the bustle. So the bustle period started in the latter 1860s, and here it is in the 1870s. Can you imagine trying to sit down in one of those dresses? 
And I don't know if you've ever seen a bustle that goes underneath, mm -hmm. but it's all this metal and horse hair Ooh. and crinoline and all this stuff. And I, I've never done it. I said, if I never wear and never make an outfit from the bustle period, I'll be all right with that because I just can't imagine. But boy, oh boy, it must have been popular because as I said, it started in the 1860s. Throughout the 1870s, you're going to see this bustle. Now, so if the bustle, and, and here, we'll just skip forward a bit. There it is again in the 1880s. The bustle lasted forever. I don't know why. I think, I think if women had their druthers, they wouldn't have because I can't imagine that it was that comfortable. And I'm sure that when you were at home and you were working, you didn't wear that bustle. It was only when you went out. But look, and look at the just of the bustle. Pardon? Why did they need it? I mean, we were proud not to show off our very area of being <laughs> It was the style. And it, obviously a, a popular style that lasted a long time about a quarter of a century. So I don't know. And, and as, I, as I was saying, it's not only the, what you're wearing underneath, but look at the, look at the design. I mean, you can't even see it very well in those pictures, but there's just all kinds of frou-frou at the back, like ribbons and bows and, and uh, different little ruffles and all of that. I, I, I don't know. I just, I can't imagine wearing it. But so, so look at the the key difference here. It's the it's it's the it's how tight the bustle is, but it's also the bodice. So let's look at the 1870s. Look at the bodice. So look at those sleeves. Right? Those sleeves are quite loose, just like the, the skirts are looser too. Right? That's an 1870s look. The hair as well, although I don't think the hair changes that much. The, the biases that you see, so if you see a woman in a bustle dress that has really tight sleeves and a really tight bodice, there's a good chance that that dress was made in the 1880s as opposed to the 1870s. So, sorry, uh, men. Okay. Well, the hair is getting a little longer. Um, still wearing those frock coats. The frock coats were ubiquitous. Now, this isn't to say that there weren't other styles, Be especially beginning in the 1850s. Men, everybody starts having more leisure time. Again, I'm talking about the wealthier classes, right? And so they start getting leisure wear too. And I don't have time to go into that, but they, they did. Um, they had some strikingly modern leisure wear actually. Okay. so. There's the 1880s. Okay, look, look at that guy on the right. It's almost getting to a point where you might consider that a modern jacket, a modern suit coat. But, and the other thing they're wearing, I don't think it's in the 1870s. No, it's in the 1880s. Spats. Spats become popular in the latter part of the 19th century for men. And this is the first appearance in this book anyway. Uh, I think it was around about this time. What's the guy on the right wearing for on his head? A bowler. It's a bowler, exactly. No bowlers before that time. So if you're seeing a bowler hat on a guy, you know, I'm not gonna say definitively because I don't, I haven't drilled down that much, but I, I don't think it was, I don't think they had bowler hats before the 1880s. So, that's, that's a good thing to remember. If you see somebody wearing a bowler hat, chances are that the photograph is not before 1880. Please, is a bowler hat a classic difference the top hat? No, actually not. I know, I know you think, you, yeah, like, I you think that, and I think maybe eventually later, that later on, it might have been the case, um, that, you know, you'd see it more on a working class. Yeah. But no, well, the bowler hat was, was worn by all classes. You're going to see even um, um, Bertie, you know, Queen Victoria's son, wearing a bowler hat. Yeah. In the early days, yeah, later, right? Later on. Yeah, exactly. Remember the 1830s? Remember those sleeves? They came back in the 1890s. 
In eight, this is eight, these, these fashions are from 1895, and that's when they were at their widest. But, um, and notice the skirt. Look at, how, look at how much more relaxed that skirt is. Um, I, I know I was reading something in, in one of my books. I think it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a, a good book. It's Everyday Dress. And they have a picture of, uh, of a lady wearing a, an outfit like that. And it said, you know, this is the first time that you, know, you could wear an outfit from the 1890s and you wouldn't look completely out of place in the modern age. Um, and it's, that's about the first time. So yeah, the skirts become much more relaxed. The sleeves, they're pretty big, but they, they don't stay like that forever. And this is when these ladies love to wear birds on their on their hats. <laughs> like sometimes they'd have four or five birds, and these were like real dead birds. They weren't. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, the, but the, but the hats weren't as big, and and notice the hats are becoming a different style than they were earlier. Whereas in the earlier time period, those bonnets they called them poke bonnets um, were were all the rage. Now we're starting to get more into this kind, this type of hat. Oh, oh, look at that. So those guys, now these guys are more leisurely, I have to admit. But um, yeah, so he's, the guy on the left is wearing a, a tie that wouldn't be out of place today. So that, that, that tie started a little bit earlier than the 1890s, but, but not much. Um, and yeah, like he's he's wearing a cummerbund. That that's definitely a style that you don't see before 1890s. I'm not sure how many people you would see in a photograph that have something like that, but you might. Depends. That's a more um, artistic look, right? Artists and creative folks might wear that, but business people not so much, right? Um, but they didn't, the, the men were not afraid to wear those patterns, like the one on the right. They did wear patterned outfits. Um, that, and notice on his head, that is uh, not a fedora. The fedora didn't come uh, about, it, it, it developed from this hat. So the hat, that hat is called a homburg. And it was actually, once again, Bertie who uh, popularized the Homburg. And a Homburg, it's like, a, this, this picture actually gives a lie to that, but generally speaking, a Homburg is like a, it's a little bit bigger than a fedora. But it, and, it, and it doesn't have um, sort of, the fedora has more of a, a pronounced peak at the front um, and maybe more of a, like, um, a curve. Whereas a Homburg is straight, straight around, the brim is a little wider, but uh, that's the fedora developed out of the Homburg. And the Homburg um, became popular in the 1890s. So now we go to the 1900s. So I tried to find one where the ladies were, I, I couldn't find, find one that was completely pronounced. But you know that look where they're, it looks like they're walking around like this, right? And it looks like they're the ladies are down to here. <laughs> yeah, that was the style. That was the style. So they, they, because I made it, of course. I, if you go to the Milner House today, you can see the outfit that I made for them. That's from this time period, and I, and they wanted all of the proper undergarments. So I started with the the corset, and the corset actually comes to here. And so it doesn't really hold you up. But they had hats that you would put in so that it looks like you're like this. It looks like you're falling out of your that was the style. They call it the S curve. And because then the style at the back is there's some pads at the back. You can't see it so much here, although the lady on the you can see more, it's more pronounced here. She's got pads there to hold her butt out. Um, but yeah, no, that was, that again was the style. Look at their hats the, and the hairstyles, right? <coughs> hairstyles are way up, the hats 
sitting here, I don't know how they ever win. Honestly. A good stiff breeze? Mm. I know. Remember, these are just pictures. They're just drawings. They're not actual photographs. But women did try to wear hats like that. And so, I don't know, I guess if you put enough cement in your hair, uh, and you know, you have enough hat pins that, you know, go through your hair instead of your head, maybe you can hold it on. But again, that was very, very much in style. Um, sleeves are still a little big, but not as big as the 1890s. And the skirts, though, they're a continuation of that early, that uh, 1890s look. We're not ever going to get the buckle back, thank goodness. So look at that. There's still so that coat now has become what's called a morning coat. So uh, and you still have you can still get a formal outfit that uh, is called a it's called a morning coat. And it's still got that frock coat look, but it's, it's got the, the rounded front, right? Um, bowler hat. See, there's a good, a businessman wearing a bowler hat. And then the, and the one on the right then is, is a more, a more uh, relaxed look. But the boater, the boater was very popular for both men and women as a more, it's summer, summer only. Uh, the, you wore straw hats in the summer. You didn't wear straw hats in the winter. You wore felt hats in the winter or silk or whatever, right? But that voter look was very popular in the 1890s and through, really through, probably to the 1930s as a, as a, um, a leisure, leisure wear. Okay. And the bow tie came in? Oh, yeah, the bow. Oh, the, yes. Yes. But a more formalized bow tie, right? Like, not the, not the loose cravat, this kind of bow, but more tight. You know, well, I'm sure you've seen, some of you probably have those bow ties that you can tie yourself rather, the one, rather than the ones that are already made up for you, right? And that's what that would be, right? Look at the collars, right? In the early 1900s, those collars got big and starched, and they're separate from the, from the shirt. So the shirt itself would have just a little stand-up collar, and you'd put these collars on. There were buttons on on the on the, the collar of the shirt that that uh, um, kept them down, kept the collar on, I should say. And then you had that collared tie. I'm sure some of you have seen that that you put underneath your uh, like sort of not tie. It's a it's a bar, I should say, a bar, right? And then you put your tie over top. I, very very uncomfortable to wear. But hey, the women, the women are uncomfortable too. So why shouldn't the men share that some of that discomfort, eh? Um, the shoes too. The shoes, again, shoes change with the times. But it, I think it would be really hard to just figure out what what age a photograph was by looking at the shoes. If you're into shoes, you could do it. But um, that's it's hard. All right, so this is 1910. So now, so now actually with the corset, the corset in 1910 has become just, it stops here. And like the idea of a corset was that it, it, it's going to hold your breath in. And right? No, by, by, it's about 1908. It starts go getting, it just ends here. And so then you got to have something else. So then they started making these covers, corset covers, and then eventually they morphed into brassieres in the latter 19 teens. And that's when we started calling the corset a girdle. But the corset itself, until this time period, was designed to be like your bra. And sometimes it's sometimes it ended here, sometimes it went down here to here, but it certainly held them up. These don't really, and you can tell, especially the lady on the right, right? There's not a lot of support there. So this is the time period of the Titanic, right? Beautiful, beautiful in, its, in its own right, but but it, it is actually, if you look at the silhouette, it's a hearkening back to the early 19th century, that time period that I like to sew, which we called empire, right? Even today we have empire waist, right? But it's a more, um, uh, vertical 
epoch as opposed to the big skirt, right? Um, hat, look at the hat on the left. Huge, absolutely huge. The hats in the early 19 teens were as big as they get, really. Well, man, I'm sorry. You got a different hat. Your collars are a little different, but you still got that frock coat. It's still happening. 1920s. Yes. All right. You know, I so I made I made sure that I got you some flapper kind of dresses. Mm -hmm. What are those hats called back in the 1910s? What is that? That those hats you mean? Like the men's yeah, hats? Yeah. Homburg. It's, it's oh, that's it, a Homburg. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, and I I believe that the fedora started coming in in about the about the late 19 teens, 1920s. Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, it's just a, it's just a variation in the style of the homburg. But you know, the fedora is still around today. It's amazing, really. And notice notice the cigarette in the guy's hand. Yeah, it was very popular at the time. It was very chic. So uh, it so I show this from the 1920s, and I think this is what year is this? 1925. But the actual Skirts started um, ra rising really during the war years. So women started wearing not really short, and even those are not really short. Some of the most daring of the flappers wore skirts above the knee, but mostly no, right? But the, the, the hem started rising in during the war years, and they kept rising, and they kept um, they they stayed above knee length or just below knee length throughout the 1920s. And it wasn't until the 1930s that they started going um, down again. Um, but there's there's a classic 1920s look, isn't it? Um, and the hair that was the, had the, you know, the, 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 the rows of curls and yeah, yeah, very popular. And well, man, now we're starting to see more of the modern suit. The modern suit actually started uh, what we think of as a modern suit. They called it <clears throat> um, a, a more of a leisure suit. There was another name for it too that I'm just not remembering right now. Um, but it was a look really from the early 1900s. So the suit as we know it today really started in about the 1900s. But see, it, even in the 1920s, that guy on the right has spats on. They, spats became, became or stayed popular probably right through to the war years, World War II. Um, Pardon me, Lisa, what's a spat? Oh, sorry. Shoes? Oh, the shoes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. These oh, yeah. things. They're not actually, they're, 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 um, so they're not your socks, but they're, you put them on, um, and they're made out of fabric, a stiff fabric that you wear, um, and they, they generally go up to about the what, what a modern sock with would be, um, and they they button, and they, yeah, you wear them over your shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wore they wore them. Military men wore them throughout. Look at the white band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that from from probably the 17th century because they protect they protect your socks and your shoes when you're walking through the underbrush, right? And uh, so that's originally what they were used for with the soldiers but they became a popular fashion item later in the in the 19th century the pointed shoes were used to cook, kick the eyes out of a snake what's that the guy's got a cup on his pants yes he does you're right you're right there is a cup yes definitely um Oh, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I do think that cups were a thing earlier, too, in some cases. So um, not necessarily just a 20th century thing. I didn't show you any, any of them, but I do believe, if I remember correctly, that I've seen cups earlier than the 1920s. Um, yeah, so so that's, that's the basics. Now... I want to show you though because so 
I say though I I said all of those were the classic look of the of the of the decade. But a decade is 10 years long. Think about the styles of 2010 and then the styles of 2020. Yeah, they didn't change completely, but there there are definite style differences in 10 years, right? So here are some photographs from the 1860s. And you can you can see if you look at the first one, well, I think that says I think it actually says 1860. No, it says 1863. That is more the very wide skirt of the 1850s. So you when you see a really wide skirt like that, you can't necessarily say, oh, that's from the 1850s. No, it actually stayed in style. I mean, think about Scarlett O'Hara, right? The, or the Civil War period, they had those wide, wide skirts were very popular. But then you look at this one, and that's from 1868. See, by 1868, we're starting to get a different skirt and it's the beginnings of the bustle. I'm not sure if that lady has an actual bustle on behind, but she might, right? So I'm, I guess I'm, what I'm saying here is that, yeah, and again, this, this, this skirt, I don't think those are actual layers. I think it's just different color fabric, but it certainly has that layered flounced look of the 1850s, doesn't it? And yet it's 1865. These are photographs as well. So maybe that dress isn't new. We don't know. But just be aware that because I said that wide skirts were a thing of the 1850s, it doesn't mean that they didn't go into the 1860s. And just because you think of the, the bustle as being in the 1870s, 1880s, no, it started in the 1860s. This is 1880 photographs. So if you'll remember, here, I'm just gonna go back. No. That's the classic 1880s look. But these ladies, look at them. Look at that one there. Doesn't that look like an 1870s? Now the bodice kind of gives it away. It's a tighter bodice, right? This one too. Right? And look at this one. Guess what? In the latter 1880s, women started not wearing the bustle anymore. And the skirts started becoming more relaxed. So that look from the 1890s actually started in the 1880s. So again, you have to I have to caution you that if you are trying to identify just based on the fashions, you can't use those general uh, the guidelines that I gave you here completely, right? And then, so this is this this is actually supposed to be 1909. So that lady on the left, she looks like that classic 1909 look, except look at look at her. She's kind of in between. She's got the more vertical uh, look of the of the 19 teens, but she's got that really low bust from the earlier part of the 1900s. Look at this lady over here. Well, she's very, very plainly, she looks like she belongs to the earlier 1900s, but these are supposedly all uh, 1909. This lady over here, she's, yeah, she looks classic, Titanic look, doesn't she? With that huge hat and, and the, the long flowing skirts, etc. cetera. Yeah. Seasonally, did the fabrics and colors change much? Uh, Amber. The fabric certainly changed. They had, they had the same things that we do today, I, you know, except they didn't have the, the, the synthetics, right? Uh, other than rayon, rayon actually is a fairly a fairly old uh, synthetic. It was the first synthetic, um, but um, so they wore silk all the time, but they wore wool in the winter time and they wore cotton in the summertime, right? And they did wear linen. Their their under things were often linen, even right into the 20th century. They were linen. Um, I find linen is more comfortable to wear against your skin than cotton. Um, so I think that's probably what they, they thought too. Um, and again, as I told you, uh, usually you wore straw hats in the summertime and some kind of fabric, 
or felt hat in the winter time. Now colors, you know, don't think that your, your Victorian ancestors all wore somber colors because they didn't. They wore the most god-awful garish colors that you would never consider wearing, especially in the 18 50s and 60s when they started uh, th that's when they started having synthetic dyes because before that time there were no synthetic dyes and these synthetic dyes were pretty bright and as I say like a really bright pink and they'd wear it with a really bright orange or whatever like they yeah they they were not afraid of color of course you know yes you had your widows and there was that whole mourning thing. But I have to believe that if you're a working class woman, you're not worrying too much about that mourning thing. Maybe if you have a black outfit, you would wear it for a while. But you aren't necessarily gonna, you know, this idea that you have to wear mourning for a year and then you go into half mourning. Yeah, that was a thing amongst the middle class. And actually, you know, I just, I just read something just recently that was very interesting that said that the beginnings of the ready-made fashions, so where you go to the store like we do today and buy the clothes already made, started with morning clothes. And when you think about it, that makes perfect sense because when someone dies, you don't have a lot of time to make black clothing. And so that's when the ready-made stores started because you could go, go to a store and buy something already made in black for you. And I, again, this is the 1920s and, and uh, I, you know, no, actually, sorry, I lied. This is, this is the late 19 teens because it looks like the 1920s, doesn't it? If you look at that, you think, Oh, those are those ladies, uh, you know, the man again, the men are harder to, to, to buy, but those ladies look like they're from the 1920s. No, they're actually from the late teens. So that style that we think of as a roaring 20s style actually started after the war. All right, back to my lady. Okay, so um, you see this skirt, you can tell it's, it's got to be 1890s or at the very earliest, late 1880s. Because, you know, I thought, okay, at first, maybe there's a bustle. Maybe there's a bustle behind there. But just the way she's sitting, she's not sitting on a bustle. So it's definitely 1890s. It's not, it could be early early 1890s. The sleeve is it's got that 1890s look, but it's not really big. So it maybe is early 1890s and then the hair as well as i said shouts out to me 1890s so i told my brother that and he said well yeah maybe but it's very interesting and i know you're genealogist so you might be interested in this so her name was eliza lamaru and she married a man she married a bonin b-o-n-i-n and their daughter became my great grandfather grandmother so that's the relation. And actually, it's very interesting because, so I knew her as Grandma Lacroix. That's, I, I, I she, she didn't live that much longer. I was quite young when she died. But um, I remember her as a dour old woman. But when she, she married, his name was um, um, Telesphore. Isn't that a 19th century name, right? She married this Telesphore Boilo and Telesphore was 25 years, like they, they were married, they couldn't have been married for more than a couple of years. And when he was 25 years old, he hung himself in a North Bay jail after having been arrested for drunken and disorderly conduct and left her with two boys. And those two boys, one of whom became my grandfather and the other, um, my, my father's uncle, but he was named, his middle name was, he took his, his uncle's name. And so then she, this is not her, um, she then remarried some years later and her second husband was much more responsible, but she, he was coming home 
um, and he stepped off the streetcar and another vehicle came and cut him down. She was watched, she watched him die. Yeah, I know, I know. And so then her son, Constance, his name was, my grandfather, also was a drunk. And he was a, a wonderful salesman. He, he went all over North, my, my, my father was born in Moonbeam, Ontario. Oh <laughs> But it's called just outside of Capus Casing. Mm -hmm. But his so his father worked for Tip Top Tailors, and he sold. He would go into the lumber camps in northern Ontario and sell these guys who were working in the lumber camps had all kinds of money. He would come and he measured measure them up and they'd put down a deposit and yeah he'd sell them suits. So when they came into town they had something nice to wear. And he, he was a great salesman. He made all sorts of money. And then he would drink it all away. And so my, my father was the oldest in the family. And there were six boys and a girl. And this girl, uh, my aunt Estelle, the youngest, whose um, husband's funeral I went to today, she was nine months old when her mother died. So I always say, you know, Angela's ashes, ashes, that story of Angela, that was my dad because they never had any money because, and, and she tried, she tried to get, to go to Tip Top Tailors and get them to send the money directly to her, mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. So he, he'd have it all gone by the time he got home. They lived in a chicken shack um, just outside of Sudbury for a number of years and, and it was on, they were squatting on crown land and there were these scrub trees and he and his brother used to have to go down and cut trees down like they were very small it was you know Sudbury it wasn't very good uh, growing land they would cut these trees down and cut them up for to um, for for their mother to keep the house um, house um, warm and uh, cook before they went to school in the morning yeah so anyway and then then my brother sent me this picture, and that is Eliza Lamaru's parents. Well, you can very clearly see the difference. I mean, she married she married this this uh, Theodore Vonin, and they um, they started by farming, but then they owned a grocery uh, business, and then later a meat and butcher shop. Well, you can see it in her clothes, can't you? But her parents, oops. Her parents were farmers yeah. and see look at that outfit so so her parents were Francois Lamaru who supposedly was born in 1821 but it also says that he married on August the 2nd 1827 and and she was born in she was born around 1826 so clearly there's something wrong there oh yeah I also wanted to tell you about Liza so my brother's, what he has right now, he said, he looked in the census records and she was registered in 1861 as being 12. Um, then when in 1871, she was registered as being eight years old. And then in 1881, she was registered as being 16 years old. So yeah, um, she probably was born in 1848, which would mean that in the 1890s, she was in her 50s. So. I think that that's been misidentified. She looks like a relative, but I don't think she's Lizzie um, uh, Lammer. Anyway, that's enough. Um, please have a look at my books. I, what I brought were books that are largely um, sort of surveys of costume. And so you get a lot of um, just the line drawing that gives you like there. This is from the early 1900s. So stuff like that, right? Um, a lot of them, there's, uh, these are, I love, I love looking at these things. Like it's, they're, they're taken ma mainly from, from photographs, but they're, they're just line drawings that show you, show you the, um, the fashion. And then as I said, there's this, which is everyday dress. I have a few that are the men, men's fashion. 
I love this. This I brought this because I wanted to show you because I use this as a seamstress all the time. So this lady, she went to this collection um, in um, England, and mainly one collection, um, and she did obviously extensive drawings from these uh, extant garments, and so she gives you the exact exact uh, how how wide these tucks with the the lines of tucks were and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I find it very useful for myself and my when I'm uh, sewing reproduction clothing. Anyway, okay, that's enough. Any questions? <laughs> very good. Very good. Were those wigs or the I had to have gold pearl? Okay, uh, I think ladies sometimes wore pieces in their hair. I don't. I'm, I'm not saying they didn't have wigs. They certainly did. I mean, uh, they had wigs in Elizabeth the first time, right? It wasn't that they didn't have wigs, but most of the time, I think they would just augment their own hair with hair pieces. Um, and rather than wigs, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say that my French grandmother died in '52, and we had one year of wearing black, oh, really? and the following year of wearing purple. Yeah. And I remember I was so sick of it all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's really something. Yeah. In the 1950s. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Did uh, Queen Victoria, did she set a fashion trend there too? She did. Um, I think they might overstate that a little bit, you know, because certainly uh, the rules for mourning kind of were being developed before she, um, she, you know, she lost Albert, but then she elevated it yeah. quite a bit, you know. Yeah. But she was a large lady, so I don't know whether she was set. Mm. Fashion trip. Oh, um, she did when she was younger more. You know, she was very beautiful. Yeah, she was yeah. tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, I went to Kensington Palace and saw her this uh, uh, riding outfit that she wore when she was first queen, and honestly, it looked like it was for ten-year-old girls. Unbelievable how tiny she was. And I did. I made a Queen Victoria dress for Liz Brown when they used to have porches and verandas in Ridgetown. She went around as Queen Victoria. So I did some research. And when uh, when um, Queen Victoria died, she was 49 inches tall and 53 inches around. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's not too fashionable. Yeah. I mean, you know, especially in her last year, she just she just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, we appreciate you, you know, telling us about some of these books. Um, in our collection, we had some photographer of the years of the photographer. Oh, yeah, that's great. And good. they're really, really good research and use a lot. So I'm assuming that some of these, when you recommend which ones, yeah. I think we'll get a few for our library, too. Okay, so. sure. Thank good. you so much. All right. Um, we do have cake, and we have crackers and cheese. It would be nice if some of the founding members maybe went over and cut the cake. That would be great. We'd love to have you do that and pass it around and stay and have some social time. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Great. Thanks. We appreciate it. Thank you.